So hello everyone. Welcome to our session on profiling a serverless host with VHive. Uh, my name is Lazar Svetković. I'm a PhD student at ETH Zurich in group of Professor Anna Klimovic. Uh, so we are going here to talk about implications of uh, serverless on computer architecture. And let's first say that uh, serverless workload has some kind of unique characteristics. And there have been a lot of work on uh, trying to figure out what are the uh, workload characteristics of serverless. So for example, I would like to mention a paper called Serverless in the Wild, in the wild um, which says that um, plenty of uh, functions uh, are invoked less than once per minute and that most serverless functions have a quite short execution time. We are here talking about uh, 60 millisecond mean time and um, one also thing is that um, there is extreme multi-tenancy, which means that more, uh, over 100 to even 1,000 of uh, functional instances reside on one physical CPU. And that's what we are, we are interested in. So uh, our tutorial here aims to study a single serverless host using VHive. And we are going to show you live how to analyze architectural application, uh, implications of multi-tenants. So uh, first, let's go to some theory and how performance uh, measurements are done on CPUs. So CPUs expose um, some metrics. And concretely here, we are talking about performance counting registers. So for example, uh, one register can be number of cache hits, number of cache misses, and so on and so forth. So I think that Intel Haswell architecture has something around 290 performance counters. And uh, you really need to be an expert in order to analyze their semantics and what they what what information they can give you. Um, some of them are uh, not backwards, they don't have back backwards compatibility and some of these metrics can be misleading. So you really need to be an expert in order to understand uh, what's what's underneath and you really need to know the details of the microarchitecture. Okay, so for that reason, in order to bring this to high level, Intel developed something called top-down top -down methodology that was done back in 2014. And we are going to use this methodology and these tools in order to um, classify bottlenecks and uh, figure out what should we do in order to improve uh, performance of our server, individual server. Okay, uh, so let's see how it looks like. Um, this is a uh, top down in a nutshell, but uh, we first should say that CPU is often divided into two parts, uh, like, yeah front-end and back-end, and front-end in this case is responsible for uh, instruction fetching and instruction decoding, whereas back-end is, uh, so takes care of instruction scheduling, execution, and eventual retiring of instructions. So uh, we are here talking about uh, out-of-order CPUs, and uh, modern CPUs can issue Four, four micro operations per clock cycle, and they can retire uh, the same number of uh, micro operations. I think that even with the newer architectures, it, the, this number rises to five, but never mind. And uh, the goal of CPU is to, is to populate all those four slots inside each clock cycle. And what should we do here? So we want to classify bottlenecks and we do that um, by counting whether we have empty cycles, em sorry, empty slots or we don't have them. And for each slot, we ask ourselves uh, in each uh, clock cycle, whether it is, uh, whether it uh, gets a micro operation or not. So if it gets a micro operation and uh, that micro operation eventually retires, then we put it into retiring category. If it gets a, a micro operation, I'm talking about slot, 
and it doesn't eventually retires, then we are talking about bad speculation category. If the slot remains empty, then we can distinguish between front end and back end bound uh, overheads. And let's see how it looks like. So when you run, uh, when you profile application, you get some numbers like this. These are some uh, measurements we got. And you have these four categories. And then, for example, you get 56.7% for backend bound. And then you ask yourself, how can I improve my program? Because this doesn't tell me too much. I want to figure out what is the concrete problem. So you go one level deeper. And this is the level two uh, categories. And then you, you run the PMU tool. And you get number like this, for example. And then you go to level three, level four, and so on. So uh, what this tells us, um, there are these few, few of these categories. And I would like to uh, tell you like about a few of them. So here we have uh, fetch latency, which means that, uh, which tells you if you have high percenters there, that there is some overhead in instruction fetching. Fetch bandwidth means that there is some overhead in instruction decoding. Then if we talk about bad speculation, we can have either bad branch prediction, which is the, uh, so it means that, uh, branch predictor is not performing well, or we can have bad data spe speculation. In uh, both cases, the instruction uh, will not be retired, right? Uh, retiring is a category where we eventually would like all our instructions to end up. And finally, we have core bound and memory bound. Core bound means that um, execution units, so functional units inside uh, back end of CPU are, are used suboptimally. So that means that some of them are not filled in every clock cycle or so. And uh, there are a few more uh, reasons why your micro operation may end up in this category. Or you have memory bound, and here we talk about uh, some problems, some overhead in memory subsystem. Okay, so the list, uh, what you see here on the screen is not exhaustive and there are plenty of these categories. Each of them have different semantics. And in order to, so when you get a number like this, 22.86, you open a manual, you see uh, where the problems may be, and then you try to uh, like improve your code. And uh, uh, so in Intel manual, there are cures uh, like explicitly written what you can do in order to fix some of these issues. Okay. And uh, sorry, do we have any questions on this topic? Okay, also no. So we have here uh, our tool and this is its architecture. So let's talk about measuring methodology for a bit. Um, we do measurements in three, phase, three phases as usual. So we are talking about warm up, profiling and cool down phase. Uh, we are interested here when the system is in stable state. <clears throat> so that means we need to warm it up, uh, implying that we don't want to count cold starts and we don't, we want to discard such measurements, sorry. So we take only measurements from the profiling phase. <clears throat> For that, we have uh, here, you see these gray boxes. Uh, up, you have uh, socket zero and you have uh, socket one. So, we have a VHI worker residing on socket one that has a certain number of firecracker instances that run there. And uh, we put uh, a loading, a load, a load client and latency client on the other socket because we want our measurements not to be biased. What that means is that uh, if you want, uh, sorry, if you want to generate a stress, uh, stressful multi tenant environment, load client will do that, but it will use a certain portion of CPU. Therefore, your measurements may be biased in case you put them on the, on the same socket. Um, on the other hand, you have latency client, which measures latency, and that's the results you will read. Uh, how it works is that you have a um, request issued to a Firecracker instance or uh, 
and then you get a response and you cannot issue further requests until you get a response and it's uh, the way how it works so we call that uh, closed loop system and we have load client which is an open loop so it models that you have unlimited number of clients and that you can have un or like almost unlimited number of requests there whereas with closed loop you have a fixed number of requests in the system um, <clears throat> supported modes here is uh i'm talking about measurement modes single configuration mode and multi-tenant simulation mode so the former the idea is to um is to have a fixed number of vms and to sweep requests per second so you are increasing the load until you reach maximum that you uh, want to reach or uh, until um, 19 percentile tail, tail latency is 10 times greater than unloaded latency so that's a criterion where when our experiment stops um, the other mode is to figure out what happens if you change the number of vms on a single host and is the same as in single configuration so it means that you sweep the number of requests but you sweep number of vms as well so you start with for example one vm then you go through all the rps's then two vms and so on and so forth so that's how it works uh, okay so i'm going to give you a live demo how how you can use these tools so let me show you um, <laughs> Okay, uh, we cannot, you cannot do this, do this currently because Google Cloud Platform doesn't support, doesn't allow you to have a look into performance registers. So I'm, I will be using uh, Cloud Lab machines, which uh, give us access to these hardware things. Uh, the reason for this is GCP probably doesn't allow it because of security. Okay um so i'm going to clone this particular branch i have prepared uh, of the vhive repository and i'm going to set up the tool which is quite simple we're going to see um yeah so you can find in all the instructions on this uh on this hyperlink and yeah, the slides will be posted. So you'll have access to all these things if you want to try this at home. And I'm going to, to run this now. The setup is quite simple. Um, I'm going to skip uh, install git because we already have that on cloud lab on this type of machine. And I'm going now to run Firecracker uh, in the background with screen. So just to make sure it's running, it is okay. Um, okay, so uh, single mode measurements. 
I have here prepared some uh, measurements to do. And here uh, we are running with two VMs. The peak RPS we want to achieve is 4K, and uh, we are increasing load by 25%. So starting from 1000 RPS to, uh, so we increase by 25% of um, 4000. So we end up with 1000, 2003, and uh, finally 4000. So this will execute for probably something less than two minutes. Um, yeah, let me tell you, so this takes time. And in case you want to run it like with a, with a that is more fine grained, then um, it will take much more time. Mm, we are going to see some output soon. Okay. It's running and it gives us percentage that this function hello world that I'm using uh, on this uh, single host uh, has back, is backend bound with percentage of 54.83. And then after this finishes, we are going to see whether whether uh, bottleneck changes with a different number of requests per second. And after uh, we get these measurements, we can run for level two. So that means that we can dig what happens in backend bound, and we can therefore find the bottleneck. Okay. So you can uh, perform measurements on every level that you saw on uh, while I was describing them. This is for level one. When you run this at home, uh, if something in some team uh, breaks, or for example, you use C kill to kill to, to stop the measurements, you, you need to clean the, the machine and then rerun everything, which won't take too much time. Like just run the install script and uh, steps and everything will be fine. Yeah, so I've explained what happens here. We have, for example, 4K RPS. We have 56% uh, uh, of my corporations end up in uh, backend bound category. And we are going to see what happens with uh, when we dig deeper on level two now. Okay. So we see that memory bound uh, issues arise with percentage of 33 and a half. Also, you can change the function you run here. We are, we are using the global fun, uh, function that is like uh, just measuring the overhead of, of the whole uh, machinery behind serverless it just enters and exits like the function doesn't have any useful code this is just a dummy uh, thing to show you for purpose of demonstration okay yeah, and it completed. So you see that at 4K RPS, uh, the distribution of overhead is a bit different. So 30% of memory bound and 24% 20, of um, core bound. So that means it's, again, you open manual and then you see, like, this is a pointer where you should work on. Okay, this is the first mode of execution. And I'm going to go back to slides now to show you the second one when we sweep the number of virtual machines so this is what you have seen uh, i put these commands uh, on slide and this is just a sample output okay we see that the results are almost the same uh, not really the like exactly the same number but something like plus minus one two which is something that is expected because we are uh, not alone in the system 
And this is when we sweep uh, the number of uh, tenants. So we go here from two to 20 and conduct measurements. These are measurements on level one. And here you can see how uh, bottlenecks change when you change the number of VMs. So yeah, one reminder, we want as much as possible micro operations to end up in retiring. And you see here that if you increase number of um, VMs front end become uh, bottleneck <laughs> bottleneck becomes dominant. Then we you can conduct measurements on level two and end up with something like this. This is for front end, for example. You see the distribution here that uh, fetch latency uh, rises with a number of tenants. And finally, we, we can do measurements on level three, which I didn't do individually, but yeah, this is. Uh, something you can see. We have uh, visualization scripts, like uh, this is what our tool gave us. Um, but this takes some time to execute, and this is the reason why I cannot do it uh, in, here in front of you, because it's like 20, 30 minutes for one uh, graph. Uh, you see this distribution overhead here, MS switches, LCP, ITLB, and so on. So for example, MS switches means that um, I think some uh, all of the instructions cannot be executed in functional units, but have to be done with uh, microcode, like a different phase of execution. LCP means that you have, uh, you need more, more than five cycles to decode instruction. Uh, and these are some peculiarities of Intel CPUs. Um, okay. And finally, we can have here takeaways. So serverless, workload has specific characteristics and that means that uh, it has implication on cpu architecture and that means that we can uh, this brings a lot of opportunities for uh, research in uh, new architectures okay uh, we have supports <clears throat> intel pmu tools for evaluation of performance bottlenecks we have manuals we have guides we have visualization script that you can use in order to help you uh, debug your uh, server <clears throat> and we have demonstrated the tools here in front of you so for any questions for any problems or whatever <clears throat> that you need you can send me an email you can find my email easily and that would be all for this for this from me for my side yes maybe dimitri should ask this Sorry, should answer this question. Yeah, for now this is this is what we have. But yeah, but but uh, let me tell you that this methodology exists for Intel, right? So what is planned for ARM? I have no idea. I'm not. Don't know what happens in there in the in the company. <laughs> so this one is basically yes, yes, yes. So this is this is Intel, right? The tool is developed by Intel. Yes. Top down methodology. Yes. So I think we should forward this question to ARM directly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I can tell you that. No, because ARM has a travel ban. So they're not allowed because of COVID. So they're not allowed to travel. So yes, I can tell you proactively, no. Okay. Maybe remotely, yeah. But not in person. So and, and, uh, uh, and then we, we also cannot apply this method to EMT server. To what? AMD. Yes, AMD. I mean, look, it, there's two things. There's the methodology, and then there is the actual implementation. Right? So the methodology is just the methodology. Yeah. Like you need a bunch of counters. The question is, do you have the right counters and how do you assemble them and so forth? And so I think it's totally doable in any architecture. If you have the right counters, again, but how do you assemble them and put them together properly? I don't think this exists in any other architecture. This, yeah, so we mentioned that this kind, this thing is not standardized, like the counters and so on. Exactly, that's, that's what I'm saying. So and it changes from from a, from one version of architecture to another. Okay. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Like, what is server or? Yeah, for for. Who would you envision to use this type of tools? So, for example, you want uh, to pack as many function instances on on one single server and then you want to figure out how many you can pack or what is the problem in your code for example 
So like identification, performance bottom identification. You can use this as a service, as a service, so you can use that as a merchant. Okay. okay. But if you want to optimize this function as a developer, you cannot know that what is the like. If you want to use that with serverless, full serverless stack and stuff, you can optimize it locally, right? Mm -hmm. But you cannot optimize it. Oh, you mean in the cloud, like you can use it on the cloud? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's for the cloud. Yeah. 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 So exactly, it's either local or like at the provider level. I, I mean, I think the difference is, I mean, okay, there may be micro architectural differences. You know, Amazon is using this version of the meaningful process, so you're using something else. Um, but I think the main thing to think about is, you know, what is going to be kind of like the level of contention and so forth, right? And of course, what you'll get in the cloud is probably not the same. Right? So, yeah. That's a Thousands or hundreds of these different functions. I think the experience there is much more. Much more the insight of the experience is much higher in terms of the functor and in your function, which are more or less the same. Right? So if you have like different users, different functions, multiple tenants, all of them execute different code or uh, work with different data, different runtimes and stuff. Like that experience, if you have also like a big enable or multi-threading or whatever, like then it's not the same as doing locally and doing that on the service level. I would say the same thing that we do with workflows, and that like the same thing with the same function, they may go step by step. So they will spread the same process to work at the same time. But you consider maybe like spreading functions and using functions. It's a common way of thinking about so that we have been trying to facilitate like, two applications. We kind of spread them around to like different servers. And then they use stress like network or memory button in a different way. And you have a to high performance because somebody is using memory button, somebody does the weird cat, like that type of cat, and somebody else is stressing the cat outside. Same thing. Okay. Then thank you.